Good morning, everybody. That's a little better. Welcome to uh, Sunday School in the new year. We're excited to uh, be able to start with Kim Hinton uh, back. He was gracious enough to uh, agree to come and uh, redo as a first one of our classes uh, something he's taught here before, but is truly one of my favorites, which is about the temple and the temple mount. Now he promises to also uh, reveal the mystery of where the Ark of the Covenant has finally been rested. So we'll uh, we'll see about that. Um, but uh, the Temple and Temple Mount is such an important part of our understanding of Jerusalem and uh, our own faith experience, and and getting a sense of uh, the development over time in. Uh, some of my Bible studies, our disciple, what our disciple three class, we've just finished with the destruction of the temple and the beginning of the rebuilding of the second temple, the, uh, and the folks going back and how different it is. And then Brother Herod comes along and makes the glorious temple that we know from Jesus's time, and we still have remnants of it today. So I want to go ahead and give Kim as much time as he can. So thank you. Welcome. Can everybody hear pretty good? I got involved in this because in our Sunday school class, we teach each other. So everybody said, you want to talk, about, you want to talk about you know this. And I said, well, I'm an architect. I'd like to talk about the Temple Mount. I don't really even know what it is. That was probably 25 years ago. As my wife, Marilyn, and she will tell you, oh, no, he got interested in something and can't let go. Of it. It's like the dog that won't let go of the Cadillac. Yeah, the original show was on slides. Remember 35 millimeter slides? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, well, first of all, I just want to say, I'm not a really a Bible scholar. I'm just really interested in, in some of these things, and particularly the Temple Mount. I went to Jerusalem in 2012. Uh, I got invited to speak at the National Convention about the Temple Mount, and based on kind of my application, and when I was accepted, I told Marilyn, well, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm not going to get up in front of a whole lot of national architects. They asked, you know, have you been to Jerusalem? So, so I went by myself, had a fabulous uh, trip. And, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about the Temple Mount is also about what's going on like right now with the 
controversy and just all the struggle that that goes on with this place in Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem in the slideshow, like the center of the world where three continents come together. And what I'm going to talk about is this this place called the Temple Mount, which you're seeing it from uh, looking directly east and has this incredible structure called the Dome of the Rock. It's the gold dome thing. It wasn't always, didn't always have gold on top. The King of Jordan paid for that, I think in the 1990s or something. Uh, incredible structure. And then if you look at it from the other direction, looking west, uh, it's it's this huge platform. It's a man-made, kind of a man-made Acropolis. Now, I try to get my research right. You know, I, I walked into the the Jewish temple that's on West End one day, walked in and said, I need, I need a copy of your Bible. And she said, why? I said, well, I just think your Bible's like ours, but not exactly right. She said, well, ours is correct. <laughs> and, and so, and a little, literally, it's a little different the way the books are arranged and stuff anyway. So I try to get research, you know, I've got all these sources and everything. And Jerusalem is just, you know, it's an, it's an incredible place. I, I know many of you are going in a tour, and uh, I'll be glad to talk with you separately about some real fine point details of things that I think you should do when you're in Jerusalem. A uh, guy told me that when he was there, he kind of snuck off and checked out some things that the rest of the tour group didn't do, and I could share with you a lot of things. That, this is an overview, okay? It's just an overview. And... Um, Historic information really varies a lot. People will say, well, you know, that's right. Well, wait a minute. No, this is right. So they disagree. And because there weren't photographs until the 18, mid 1800s, everything that you see is really kind of painted and it's envisioned by somebody. Did they get it right? I don't know. Uh, and it's going on today. There's research going on about the Temple Mount right now. I consider myself reasonably educated, try to be sophisticated. No. <laughs> that, that camel is named Kojak, and I got on that camel because I got there, and, and the, my Jewish guy said, you got to ride on the camel. These guys make money, and so let's get on the camel. If you ever get on camel, you're going to love it because you get on them, and they raise up, and then they sit down, and you get off. Marilyn and I have horses, and it's up. I'd trade them in a heartbeat. They're not very friendly. One of the reasons I got interested in this is a book that I found. My, my mom and dad passed away in 2008, 2009. But before they passed away, my mom had these old books. And one of them was this book called Josephus. And I was like, who is that? Let me go back. Go back. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. And he wrote many books that are available, fabulous stories kind of a parallel Bible stories, and then it tells all the things that happened around the time of King Herod, and then the uh, destruction of the Herod's temple later. It's really sad. I mean, ter terrible, you know, history. But um, but I read that book, and, and I'm going to refer to it as I go through this. Our story really begins with Abraham. Abraham was called by God to leave his land and go to promised land which is Canaan uh along the way he you know his wife was barren and so his wife pops up and says well you know you can have fun with my servant Hagar and you know and see what happens and she had a son named Ishmael well okay so Abraham has a son well then Sarah gives birth late in life and her son his name Isaac, and that causes a big rift. And basically, Abraham has to tell Hagar with her little boy, go away, go away. Now, an angel kind of guards her in her journey. And later, Abraham, of course, is, is called to sacrifice his son, Isaac. And if you look at this family tree, you'll notice as it goes up, it kind of splits into two areas. Well, that is Ishmael and Isaac. And that really starts the ultimately the Islamic tradition and the Jewish tradition. Of course, originally things were pretty good between uh, 
the Jews and the Egyptians. But then, you know, somebody comes into power and turns them all into slaves. And Moses shows up to fix that. Uh, and of course, there's the dealing that Moses said, let my people go. Okay, so he deals with the Pharaoh. We don't exactly know which Pharaoh. Is it this Pharaoh? <laughs> you know, it's on every year. I watch it every year. You know, I got to watch the thing, you know. The yield printer is just so cool. But it's more likely that it was an earlier Pharaoh that that had really made it terrible for the Jews. And of course, they have the Exodus. They leave and they go down to Mount Sinai on the way. Of course, they have to, everything has to be fixed because they get to Mount Sinai and bad things happen there. Let's go to Mount Sinai. Looks like a great place, doesn't it? <laughs> Vacation land. Well, of course, Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, the tablets. And those tablets are very important, so they build a box to keep the tablets. And that's a box. It's called the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And it's really, as a lot of things in the Bible, all the dimensions are very clear. You know, that's a certain size. All right? Now, what is a cubit? Okay? I'm going to prove to everybody in this room, put your arm out, okay? Everybody, come on, come on. Put your arm out. All right, clean it up. That's a cubit. It's about 18 inches. A royal cubit is like 20 inches, whatever. That's a cubit. Okay, so now we know the size of this box. Of course, that's the real Moses, right? And he shows up. I saw this, and I try to update this constantly. I saw this like a month ago. I just laughed out loud. He was the first man to download files from the cloud using a tablet. <laughs> Isn't that good? <laughs> well, okay, but the but there they build the box. The box is thoroughly described, and of course, you know the worship it. That's where the rules. You know, that's where our laws are. You you don't really worship the the ark, but you are aware of it. God shows up and kind of hovers around it, but it's really dangerous, uh, and it's very unpredictable, uh, and it zaps and kills people near it. That's like it has an electric charge or something. And so, whoa, it gets around that this thing is really powerful. Of course, while they're in, wandering in the wilderness going to the promised land, they have to set up something called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is a big tent surrounded with a big curtain, and the Ark of the Covenant is placed inside it. Uh, and eventually they're moving, and they decide to get to the promised land, cross the river with it. And because it's very dangerous, it's usually covered with a, some type of cloth, and you can see the red covering. You don't see the, the art as it is. It's always covered because it's dangerous. And they want to kind of, I don't know, it's like keeping a lid on something. Don't, don't let it out. And they go to the promised land. Of course, the promised land, you can see here with Egypt to the left and the promised land to the right, that the rest of that whole part of the world is not very conducive to growth or anything. You know, it's, it really is the wilderness. So they walk into, uh, you know, to take over the town. And, uh, you know, the people up on are laughing because Jericho is a protected city. And here are these crazy people walking around. They're carrying a box and the blowing horns and like, but it works, you know, the walls fall down and you can see the Ark of the Covenant, these historic images, it's, and word gets around, don't mess with the Jews. They've got this box and they've got the Lord behind them. And so the promised land came and becomes the promised land. The Philistines are nearby there. Let's invite this guy over for dinner. Doesn't he look nice? Uh, and of course, they want that box and they capture the box and they take it back to their area and they put it beside their God, who is a statue called Dagon, I think. And they put, and then the next morning, and then and all, bad things started happening. You know, everybody gets sick or whatever. And uh, their God falls down. And so they're like, get this thing out of here. We don't want it anymore. And they put it on an ox cart and send it back home. Literally, put it on an ox cart. You know, you ox, you take it back to the Jews. We don't want it. Along comes King David. And 
the real story I'm telling you is thoroughly documented in First and Second Kings and Second Chronicles about what happens with the box. Uh, King David establishes or reinforces Jerusalem as a hilltop town, and he builds kind of his little, you know, his palatial structure at the top of the hill. And he brings in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. That's a really big deal because it had been moving around at different sites. People didn't know exactly what to do with it. It's either in a tent, it had been in the tabernacle. It's a, so they get so King David's like, I'm gonna make a place and we're gonna get it into Jerusalem. Of course, they bring it in. You can see it, the arrow, it's covered for protection, but it's a big deal. This is a real celebration, big accomplishment by King David. King David has some problems. He, 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 you know, he sees Bathsheba and, you know, says, I, I, I want her. And, you know, the guys and say, well, you know, you can't have her. She's married. And he goes, oh, well, I'll fix that. He puts her husband on the front line of a war. That takes care of that. He ends up with Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Sorry, I may get some of the pronunciations of words wrong. Uh, but because of this and a lot of other things, King David gets in trouble with the Lord. He does a census and some other things. And again, biblical scholars can tell you all the details. But he gets in trouble, so much trouble, that an angel, an angel of the Lord with a sword shows up on the hilltop near his house and says, we've had it. We're just going to get rid. We're going to start over. And King David runs up and says, no, look, look, it's not, it's not my people. It's me. I'm the one that's made this mistake. Please do not destroy all the people. Well, the angel says, you know, and the Lord says, okay. And the angel flies away. King David, you know, again, these are art, uh, these are artistic renderings. He is so happy. It's like, I can't believe this has happened. We're going to build a, a an altar there and he purchases the property from the property owner he pays for it and and the value of the land is different in different parts of the bible but he basically buys the property he says i have to buy this i have to have this and as you can see there's the angel of death flying away so david has saved his people well this is where josephus comes in when i tell you about the historian because there's a story in Josephus. It's not in the Bible, but it is written by him. And this is Xerox from this old copy of the book my mom had, it was written like 1830. And it's just Xerox a page. And it says that Abraham, that the place where that happened for King David was the same place where Isaac was almost sacrificed. And that, that means that space that place, that rock is really important, okay? But it doesn't say that in the Bible. It says that Abraham tra traveled to the land of Moriah to do this, almost the sacrifice of, of Isaac. But Josephus says, you know, he went to that spot. So that spot now is really sacred. And it's the hilltop up above King David's kind of palatial area. Now, King David is not allowed to build the temple. He's done too many bad things. But he has a son, and that son is allowed to build the temple. And when people ask me, who is the architect of the first temple, Solomon's temple? It wasn't Solomon. It was his dad. His dad figured out things and did all the scripture. You're going to do this and this and this. First King Solomon gets in power, and he is really, really successful. He is one of the smartest guys. You know, the story about the two prostitutes that claimed the baby, and he said, well, we'll just split it down the middle. And the one who's, it's not her child, she says it's okay. But the mother, really the mother of the child says, no, 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 you cannot do that. Of course, King Solomon says, I think we know who the real mother. Well, his wisdom just spreads. Of course, he's building the empire, super successful. So he wants to build a temple. And he needs wood. There's not a lot of wood. Uh, there's a lot of stone and stuff in Israel, but there's not a lot of wood. So they go to a place called the Cedars of Lebanon, like our Cedars of Lebanon. Of course, the Cedars here are big Cedars. And that wood is brought in. Of course, he pays for it. And so he builds the first temple. And 
the hilltop, land of Mariah, remember that term, Mariah, he builds it, and there are a lot, I'm going to show you different images, but basically he builds his temple on top of that rock, right on top of it. And it's a big deal. The temple's finished. It's a big deal. They bring the Ark of the Covenant in. Of course, it's still covered, covered up. And this is an artistic rendering of the temple. I've seen many. This seems reasonably accurate that it looked like this. It wasn't real big. And there are tons of books about this. But basically, it had, it had a porch outside. It had a big chamber. Priest, you couldn't go in there, but the priest could go in the mid-chamber. And then in the back was a little space called the holy, the holiest of the holies. And in that was the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and the description of how it's built, what it has, it's an OSHA dream. Because uh, one of the things you had to do is have, I think it was, you had to have um, 4,000 musicians on site while you're building the temple. That was required. And there's a whole lot of gold, like 4,000 tons of gold, okay? I checked the price on gold on Friday. is $1,870 an ounce. So what does that equate to? $242 billion. So if you win the lottery, the big lottery that's going on right now, that's just a small sum compared to the amount of money of gold in, inside the temple. There it is on top of the hill. When Yeshiva comes to visit, I don't know where the king of Sheba was. He's not mentioned, but she came to visit. And in the Bible, it says, King Solomon gave her everything she desired. And so most people think, well, that was a child. After Solomon dies, the, the Jewish kind of nation, it divides up two sons. They hate each other. They split things up, and they end up with the northern kingdom, which is called Israel, and the southern kingdom that's called Judah, and Jerusalem is in Judah. Now, because they've split up, they become victims. And the first group are the Assyrians, and they come, show no mercy, and they haul a lot of people back to where they are. And they, well, you know, they basically enslave the uh, Jewish folks. But it gets worse. Uh, then Nebuchadnezzar comes into power in Babylon, and he marches against Jerusalem. But the difference is he destroys the temple. And that begins something called the real, the real exile, which you're familiar with, the Babylonian uh, ex the exile into Babylon. While they're there, Ezekiel, who's you know mentioned in the Old Testament, has a vision about a temple. It's it's never built. It's just a it just describes it. King Cyrus comes into power, and, and he does a really unusual thing. He sends all, all the Jewish folks back to their country and he gives them back stuff that they, you know, that they'd stolen. And he says, you go back there and you real build your temple. You know, oh, by the way, don't mess with me. I expect loyalty. So they go back. Well, when they get back, they don't have the money or the power or anything that they had earlier. Yeah. And it's a real struggle to get the temple rebuilt, but it is rebuilt. Uh, and it's finally finished. It's nowhere near as glorious as the first temple. Zerubbabel is one of the people that urges this to happen with his people, and they finally finish it. And so um, after the exile, you know, Jerusalem's not the same thing. It's not a center of power. Anymore. Long comes King David. I mean, King Herod. Now, King Herod is Jewish, sort of, but sucks up to the Romans big time. I mean, he'll just do anything. He can, he's a, a monster, and he will do anything to keep in power. And the Romans let him have that power because the Romans realize that the Jewish people are really hard to control. They're just really hard to control. So let them have their religion. Let them have things, but just don't let them get out of hand. Okay, and King, David's, uh, King Herod's like, I'll take care of it. And what it does is he really builds the temple. But not only that, he builds something called the Temple Mount. It's a man-made acropolis. 
Uh, just to give a comparison, Athens, the Acropolis in Athens, which is kind of a natural outcropping, seven and a half acres. Temple Mount's 37 acres. It's, it's enormous. Now, it's 37 acres now. I say it's, that's the size of it now. It got enlarged at different times, but it's, but it's big. And it's all, it's all man made. Most of it's man made. And so he wants, Herod, Herod wants to make this established thing. So he builds this enormous temple. Where does he build it? Over the rock, the rock that I mentioned earlier, down here. And they build these walls inside and flatten this area. And he builds, at the time, was the largest structure in the Eastern Roman Empire. It's enormous, like 100 feet tall, a colossal structure on this plateau. And this is the temple that Jesus visits. And that's thoroughly described in Josephus, you know, a modern copy of the book compared to the really old one I have. It's gigantic. And of course, since it's tall, it's also a lookout. So the Romans love it. You know, okay, thank you for building this. By the way, our soldiers will be on top looking around, making sure nobody gets out of control. And the Jews worship there and everything's okay because the Jews get to do what they want. The Romans are occupying the area and, you know, we're really in charge. Just don't mess with us. Uh, and, you know, things... Seem to be okay. And this big temple is enormous. Uh, it's different than the first temple in that it has a chamber. Uh, it has one big place where the priest could go, and then the back chamber, the holiest of the holies. But there's no mention about the Ark of the Covenant. You know, there's no mention about it. Um, but there is one thing, and this is this curtain. Uh, yeah, this curtain, woven curtain that separates one area from the other. And this is still the rock, but there's no Ark of the Covenant on top. By this time, it's not mentioned. Something happened to it. We know this temple existed, Roman coins, other evidence. And this is where that is located, the Temple Mount. And Jesus shows up. Of course, you know the story. Jesus comes and and he is not happy with the situation, and he gives he gives a talk around the base of the temple because you got to sort of pay to get up in the temple. You've got to bring an offering or whatever. And Jesus speaks at this little plaza. When I was there, there it is, a sort of plaza. And so, whether he really spoke there or not, questionable because the wall beyond was rebuilt by the Crusaders. And so, a lot of things there. Of course, he's really mad. You know, you've made this place a den of thieves. And he predicts it's all going to fall apart. It's all going to be gone. And, you know, he's killed because of that. And it's interesting because when that happens, the curtain in the temple splits. And that's a really symbolic thing for Christianity because that guard between the holy of the holies and the people goes away there's no need for a, a holy of the holies everybody has access yeah. yep. uh, in mark's gospel uh the word for is torn in two in greek is schizo it's like schismatic uh, in the same way. Right. it's only used at one other place in the gospel, and that's when John baptizes Jesus, and the heavens were rent, and God said, you are my beloved. It's kind of this arc in Mark's gospel uh, from the beginning and the end, and today being the baptism of Jesus Sunday, it's kind of interesting to think about that. It is, and this is the value of having a real biblical scholar, because, you know, that the story, well, it, it's interesting, did it split, did it split in half, and, you know, whatever, but, you know, bottom line is, that whole separation between the Lord through other sources, you know, no, you can have direct connection. Of course, the Romans are in charge, but their Jewish folks hate the Romans, and they make it very difficult for the Romans. You know, they're constantly throwing rocks at them, throwing oil on top of them, and it gets to a point where Titus, who's in charge, he's the son of the emperor at the time, he's like, we've had it, and it's just gotten out of hand, and so Titus, you know, it's like, we just got to stop this. You know, the Jews are crazy people. We're just, we're just going to stop this, 
So the Romans decide we're going to put into this, we're going to destroy this temple. And they do. And of course, there's a lot of booty in the temple that gets hauled back to Rome. But basically, the Temple Mount, which is, has this huge temple, becomes this pile of rubble. Everything's hauled off. Very sad day. And the ark, Titus is built in Rome to honor, you know, the big shot, the guy who later becomes emperor. And we know that because there's sculpture on the Ark of Titus in Rome that shows the booty, you know, the candelabra, all this stuff. They, they, they show the Jews, you don't mess with us. Solomon's temple is destroyed on the ninth day of the 11th month. Herod's temple is destroyed on the ninth day of the 11th month. And that is a holiday, or not really a holiday, it's just a memorable day. 9-11. So for me, that's pretty ironic that that occurred. And I, whether that was planned or not, I don't know, but that's the first Romans control everything. And even having done that, um, there's still there's still a problem. The Jews have, you know, the Jews have been scattered everywhere. But Hadrian shows up. Well, Hadrian shows up and he's like, well, there's this, these, these people that are worshiping this guy named Jews. Jesus, you know, what is the deal with that? And he shows up and he says, well, uh, the Temple Mount is gone. The temple's gone. And he said, well, you know, I'm going to build a temple to me there. He does that. Uh, and yet along comes a new emperor, Constantine, and he accepts Christianity. He sees a cross in the sky before an important battle in Rome. And because of that, he says, oh, I think I'm going to side with the Christians who are growing in Rome. You know, it's a growing religion, but Hadrian's trying to squash it. But Constantine says, you know, I think this is the way. This is the way we should go. He becomes the emperor. Well, he's, he uh, eventually adopts Christianity. So what does he do? He sends his mom, Helena, to Jerusalem to fix where where was this guy where was this guy Jesus where you know what what was he doing I mean, what's the story and so his mother finds a place reportedly where Jesus was crucified and buried and she says we're going to build something here we're going to make this an important spot which they do and he built a big basilica there and this becomes the church of the holy sepulchre which is the most important christian site in the Middle East. Well, what goes on at the Temple Mount? Well, Constantine says, tear down those temples there, and this place is disgusting. Nobody should go there because it's where the Jews, you know, the Jews killed Jesus. Pagans built a temple there, and so it has become something that nobody wants to be around. That the Temple Mount is like, and literally, I think I read that it becomes a dump. They just dump stuff there. A long time. Muhammad. Muhammad's the last prophet, and I don't know how many of you have read the Quran. I've read different sections of it. The most sacred place in Islam is Mecca. There are three sites, Mecca, uh, Medina, and then Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is important because there's a book in the Quran called the Night Journey. And you will hear often that you will hear Muhammad ascended into heaven, like he died and ascended into heaven from Jerusalem. That's not what, that's not the story. The story is that he had a night vision. It was a vision. It was a you know vision from God, perhaps whatever. But he traveled on a winged horse from you know south where Mecca and Medina is located, and he came to the Temple Mount to come to that stone, the stone. And he goes up into heaven and he meets prophets on the way, but it's all a vision. He didn't die there. That day. So the Temple Mount now becomes a place that the Islamic faith is very interested in. Why? Because of the stone, the stone that I mentioned. Uh, this guy who was a very rare indication because Islam, you're not allowed to show depictions of people, whatever, but this coin had this guy who had it built they found the stone 
they built a structure around it and it was called the Dome of the Rock. Uh, it's a dome over a rock and it's a shrine. It's not a temple, it's a shrine. There it is. Built in six, you know, it took a while to build it. And there it is on the Temple Mount. That's the dome. And if you go to Jerusalem, I urge you to go up on the Temple Mount if you want to and go see. You cannot get inside it, but you can see it. Now, Islam takes over, you know, conquers that whole area. Just to give you an idea, you can see the scale of these structures. At the bottom, you can see Solomon's Temple compared to the Temple by Herod and then the Temple, the Dome of the Rock. This is it. It's beautiful. Inside, chamber. Now, what's in the middle of the chamber? The rock. And there it is. There's also nearby a mosque that's built called the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And that's the arrow to the left. That's where people go to worship. That's a picture of it. And sometimes you'll hear that Jews, the, the Muslims are up on the Temple Mount. They're praying. Well, they're really praying at this location or outside it. And this is a picture of kind of a normal Friday. There'll be hundreds, you know, thousands of Muslims praying on that plaza. They are not looking at the rock. They are looking toward Mecca. You know, Muslims are supposed to pray, I've got to say, toward Mecca. And you see enormous crowds. Well, you know, the Christians in Europe are like, well, this is a real disaster. We got to take this over. We're going to have the Crusades. And they show up and capture Jerusalem. And a really funny thing happens. They get there and they think, well, here's Solomon's temple that we've been hearing about forever. Well, it's not. It's the Dome of the Rock. Well, they make it into a church, put a cross on top and everything. And we know this because woodcuts and other evidence from that time shows that they got to Jerusalem, they discovered, they discovered the, uh, uh, of course, they also discovered the site where Jesus was crucified, but it's a big deal to also have found Solomon's temple. Pictures of it, Temple of Solomon. The Knights Templar's logo with a tulip dome. It's the wrong place. Uh, of course, the Crusades happened, but they don't work out very well. Solomon comes in. He's victorious. The Crusades are over. You know, there were many Crusades. But we end up with something called the Knights Templars in Europe and other places. And that's an old, completely fascinating history. As we move to the present day, what happens is now we have photographs. That photograph at the bottom, I think it's the first photograph. So all these, all these drawings and paintings and everything now become evidence, real evidence with photographs. And the British get very interested in antiquities. Uh, in fact, this recent November was the 100th anniversary of King Tut's tomb being discovered. And so their interest in the Middle East just jumps and they establish something called the Palestine Exploration Group. They get very interested in what the Temple Mount is, what had it had. They do research trying to recreate what was done there, how it was built, and then they get inside it. They get under it. They con, they, they bribe the uh, Muslims that kind of are control, and they get under tunnels, and they have a lot of document about what they find underneath. One of the things they find are a lot of cisterns, water under the Temple Mount, and that's important because that allowed, if there was a siege of the Temple Mount, you had a whole lot of water a lot of water, the Great Sea. Now, that's a big cavern under the Temple Mount, but you can't go see it now because the Muslims won't allow it. But under Jerusalem, what's there? Pretty interesting. M many in this room remember the Sixth Day War, right? Okay, I remember as a kid, Moshe Dayan, the guy with the patch, great military leader. Man, they just captured the whole area, the Temple Mount, and what's now called the occupied West Bank, which I think should really become part of Israel, but that's my opinion. Uh, but he also, the, his soldiers go on top of the Temple Mount and they put an Israeli flag on top of the, tip of the Dome of the Rock. And Moshe Dayan says, take it down, take it down. We got to get along. 
So they make an agreement with a group, an Islamic group. You can have the Temple Mount. We want the Western Wall. So the Temple Mount becomes under the control of it, the Muslims. But the Jews have control of the Western Wall because the temple is gone. Herod's temple is gone, but that wall is still there. So that becomes the Western Wall. Now, Wailing Wall is a derogatory term, and it's because historically that wall, which was literally a wall with a little alleyway, uh, the, the Muslims on top would say that Jews are crybabies. They're wailing. They're always wailing against this wall. They, you know, they're crying. They're, they're wailing. And literally, it's just a wall and a thing. Well, after the Six-Day War, it becomes a big plaza, and that's what I visited. And they separate men and women from each side. It's incredibly powerful to be there, especially when you see these stones. There's a tunnel that you may be able to get into. If, if you can, I urge you to go. Because in the tunnel, you will see the stones at the base of the Temple Mount. This one stone, 44 feet long, it's nine feet high, and they think it's a certain feet deep, but they can't drill in because it freaks everybody out. Weighs 70 tons, no, weighs what? 570 tons. And I put my credit card in the joint, and I couldn't put my credit card in the joint. I don't know how they made it. I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, uh, and you could see one of the cisterns, but this is a cistern outside simple man so there we got it okay well the reason that's interesting is there was king herod's uh temple there and now it's the dome of the rock but if you get the dome of the rock the rock and look at it you notice something you notice a rectangle okay on top of the rock it's a depression everybody see this this okay the dimensions of that depression are the dimensions of the ark of the covenant so many historians think that's where that rock stood but that's where the ark of the covenant sat on that space that sacred rock with the sacred object because if you look at diagrams just when the architecture stuff i just had more fun with this you look at the architecture diagrams you figure out where the, the, that, that recess in the stone is, that tells you where the temple actually was. Now, the Muslims do not allow anybody to do any archeological work because basically they say, look, Muhammad's the last prophet and he's the right guy. We got it worked out and you Jews are wrong, you Christians are wrong. And we, you know, we, we don't care about that earlier temple. Well, the Jews care a lot about the old temple. They want it to come back. And so there's a quest, you know, and, and there's a lot of stories about this. Uh, I mentioned Solomon's temple. It's followed by the second temple after the exile, followed by renovations, and followed by Herod's temple, and followed by the Dome of the Rock. So that's the history of the Temple Mount. So what happened to the Ark? All right, Guy, you said you think you know where it is? I know where it is. Argument that it could have gone down to Egypt, but uh, you know it's a, one of the great mysteries. It is a great mystery, but I know the location. Ready? Everybody ready? Yeah. Well, we know that in before uh, before Herod built his temple, a, a group from Egypt came over and they attacked Jerusalem. And uh, this, this bad guy or king sent his people, and he took everything away. Well, that may mean that he took the Ark of the Covenant away. He attacked the city. He didn't destroy the temple, but he took the good stuff and headed back to Egypt. That's the basis of this movie that we've all seen, like Raiders of the Lost Star. That's the basis for the story. And remember, he goes in and finds a little model of this city where they took the thing back. 
course, they lift it up. You know, that's the coolest thing in the movie. They lift it up. And then, of course, because it has power, it zaps everybody at the end. But, you know, Harrison Ford and the cute girl aren't destroyed because they don't look at it. You know, just don't look at it and you'll be okay. But then there's another story, and that's the one that Guy is mentioning. This book is like this thick. Remember I mentioned the Queen of Sheba? The Queen of Sheba was probably from Ethiopia. And what may have happened is at some point before the temple was destroyed, the first Solomon's temple was destroyed. The Ark of the Covenant was moved down to the Nile on an island there and then later moved to Ethiopia in a little town called Oxum. There it is. Okay. So it went from here down the river to this island and then all the way down here. Now, that sounds crazy to me, but there's a church there and there's a chapel there beside the church called the Chapel St. Mary. And one guy is allowed in and takes care of it and they have a festival every year. Well, let me go back to this. Graham Hancock, the guy that wrote the book that I just showed you, he goes down there, he gets on the fence and he says, you got to let me in. The guy says, no. You got to let me in. No. Is it here? Yes. Well, can I see it? No. Well, why can't I see it? Could you take a photograph? No. Is it here? Yes, it's here. Eventually, I think some of us uh, find out and fly a little very small drone in there, you know, sneak in there because, you know, that is happening with all kinds of things. So the list of where it could be is here, okay? But I know where it is. Yeah, Remember the movie? That's where it is. Now, I'll end with two things, and thank you for your patience. One is that this place is really relevant. I mean, January the 3rd, the defense minister of Israel, you know, Israel's going through different changes in power, and the, you know, the head guy and all that stuff, where it's Netanyahu, the right wing, the right wingers are like, we need to get that Temple Mount back under our control so we can eventually rebuild the temple because that's what we're supposed to do. Of course, the Muslims are like, I don't think so. You know, we control things. And that tension, and he went up on the Temple Mount. Now, when I went to Jerusalem, my Jewish God, Zionist God. I said, well, you want to go up there? He said, no, I don't go up there. We don't need that because the dome, the shrine of the rock is a, you know, that's a shrine, Islamic shrine. We have the Western wall. Eventually we will rebuild the temple on top. And I said, oh, okay, right. Good luck. But he went, Jewish guy with a, a Jewish rabbi, went on top to see the place. And that caused riots. And it's going to cause more riots because you've got two forces that cannot seem to get along. And to me, as I finish this, you know, you get the light signal, like stop. <laughs> so it's that hook. Is that in the end of days, we hope this works out. We just don't know, right? But we're reminded of something that I want to tell Muslims, Jews, and all of us that when Abraham died, his two sons came together to bury him. Don't we want that to happen? Don't we want that to happen? I sure do. Thank you. And I'll, yeah, and I, next week I'm going to talk about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I'm going to tell the story of that structure where they think Jesus was buried. And just like the Ark of the Covenant, we're not sure where Jesus was buried. There's a lot of debate. And so uh, that's what I'm going to cover. So uh, I didn't go into that today, but but at all, but I'm going to go into the great, great dumb architect story. I go to Jerusalem. I get there. You know, flying to Tel Aviv, go to my hotel, get there in you know mid of the day, can't sleep, go downstairs like eight o'clock, ask the concierge, what should I do? I, I can't sleep. He said, you should go over to see the uh, Western Wall. I said, well, it's, it's like a Sunday, like nine o'clock. He said, oh, it's open all the time. I said, okay, great. Get in a cab, go over there. Those pictures you saw where the guys are against the wall, 
I'm there talking to, you know, the really religious guys that, you know, with the long beard, you know, they're doing this thing and they're all over the place, but it's not really crowded because it's, you know, it's a night at like 10 o'clock at night. Well, I'll stay there and stay there. And then I decided to walk south and I noticed that there's kind of a pathway. The Western wall is on the other side. This is the Eastern wall of the Temple Mount in the foreground. Mount of Olives. This is the Mount of Olives, just the Simony is right over here, and this is an area, and there are huge cemetery uh, items here because Jews want to be buried there because when the Lord comes back, you will follow him first in line to get back into the great temple. Well, the Muslims have made a joke of that. The Muslims have they put their things up here, and it's a joke. It's like stones with Islamic writing, like, you're not going to get back. We're in charge. Well, I'm here, and I walk around the side where I told you Jesus may have lectured, and I walk along, and get right here. There's a path. Now, there's lights and everything. There's nobody. There. Nobody. There. So I thought, I want to see one thing. It's called the Golden Gate, this. Because the Golden Gate is supposedly, uh, it's all walled up. And it wasn't built at the time of Harry, it was built later. But supposedly Golden Gate is, uh, is where the Lord will come into the temple. He will come over the Mount of Olives, and he goes into the Temple Mount, and all the Jews will follow him, and we'll have paradise. This is a picture of it. So I'm walking along this trail. It just so happens that I'm doing that at like 1 o'clock in the morning. And I want to see this thing, the Golden Gate, okay? So I get up to it. There it is. Uh, it's 1.45 in the morning. And I'm looking at it. And I walk over. And I get all over the little metal railing. I go over and I touch it. And all of a sudden, this person says, what are you doing? I turn around. And there are three Israeli officers with Uzis pointing at me. What are you doing? Whoa. whoa. I'm just an architect from Nashville, just wants to see this thing. Come with us. So we back up, and he said, you go that way. And, of course, I'm walking, trying to talk to him. Want to talk. And finally, we sort of get to the end, and he asked me a few more questions. So I think I convinced him that I'm just really a dumb guy, but I wanted to see this. In fact, I walked around and saw the, that same structure later in the day. <laughs> so, you know, but there was, there's no cars, there's no nothing about it. It's usually filled with tour buses and people and everything. Nobody there. Three officers with Thuzis with me. So they walked me down the hill. One of them walking down the hill. And this car comes screaming down the Mount of Olives Road, pulls up to the bottom. It's a taxi. And the Israeli officer opens the door and says, you, you go back to your hotel. I will. I get the car, go back to the hotel. What I didn't know is because that's supposed to be the entrance, there have been many plots to blow it open. And I had a camera bag. As far as they knew, I was going to come up and try to blow it open. And they've shot people. I don't know that they've killed people doing it, but there have been many things. So the best book on the subject is this book on tourism. And with that, thank you again. Okay, and I'll take some questions. Well, before uh, we uh, I don't know why you can't have a question and you want to come on up and, and ask Karen. Otherwise, we need to run on the word of uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm enjoying I want to say one thing. I'm available to come do this at any church at any time. I've done this out at the Jewish temple. But that, was, that was interesting because, you know, they're like, hey, you, you can't get this right. And I, I did okay. Uh, but to do it church, I've done it at Rotary Club. And my fee is a decent grilled cheese sandwich. Okay. Thank you. That's very how 
Well, so good to see you, girl. Show you where he's maybe they don't know. Thank <laughs> you.